Okay, there we go. Hey folks, how are you doing? So here we go with another rundown. I'd wager there's at least one thing in this you didn't know about or haven't seen. And if there isn't, I'm sure you will let me know in the comments. So let's get stuck into it. This is a long one. So grab yourself a beverage as usual, sit back and enjoy. Oh, be warned, there are some massive spoilers in this. Okay, this is one um, I thought had been removed, so I didn't leave it in in my other videos, but then when I was replaying one of the endings, I noticed it was actually when you enter Mikoshi. There's a scene where you're going up some stairs to the place where you make the final decision. On the way up the stairs, you see the cat, and then when you go around the corner, you see the cat again in real kind of Matrix style. So you, you, it's like a glitch in the Matrix, but you see the cat twice going up the stairs, which is kind of cool. Oh, déjà vu. In that same ending, so any of the ones where you are V and not Johnny going in to destroy Makoshi, uh, you get that scene where you go up the stairs to that balcony. If you didn't give Jackie back to his family, you will see him there as V. You will talk to him. It's nice to see him again, but at the same time, it's not because it's clearly just an engram and it's kind of sad at the same time. Goodbye. But you know, it's nice to be able to see Jax one last time. Gonna say goodbye, After even if it isn't him. On the same See note, if you didn't give Jackie back to his family and you left him go to Vic, again, Arasaka will get hold of him and make an engram of him. And uh, when you were playing the Arasaka ending, when you get to meet the engram of Arasaka himself, just afterwards, you can actually ask to speak to Jackie. It's also possible that you have to have learned that Arasaka have him through having a conversation with Vic earlier on in the game as well. Um, otherwise, you might not be able to Jackie ask this question, lives. but I haven't tested that. But again, unlike Arasaka's engram, who actually kind of feels like you're talking to a person, like when you're talking to Johnny, Jackie is much more of an AI construct with pre-programmed lines. It's quite sad to see him like that, but um, but yeah, that's what happens if you don't uh, give him back to his family. If, if you don't give him to his family, uh, Mama Wells delivers the keys to the bike to your apartment. You don't get to do heroes, but you do get to see Jackie again, or at least an engram or a copy of Jackie. On to the next one. Uh, the Batmobile or the Merkman car, which is the black Rayfield Caliburn that you can find in the tunnel network after Ghost Town. I've got a whole video on how to actually get this one because there are certain criteria that need to be filled out before you can actually access it. So check that out if you're having trouble finding the Batman car. Now, you might not be aware of this, but you probably will, that you can turn the bike wheels on and off. Uh, that's E on PC. And um, I think it's, is it clicking one of the analogs? I need to check that on consoles. Johnny Silverhand's Porsche. If you outright kill this guy during the mission chipping in and you don't hear him out, you won't find out about Johnny Silverhand's Porsche. So make sure you do and you get the iconic Porsche. You gotta have the full set right, you gotta have all his gear, you gotta have his gun and you gotta have his Porsche. Okay, out in the desert there is a, uh, I don't want to say a cult, but they're around a campfire and when you turn up by the mere act of your presence, they all instantly die and it uh, looks like you bring a negative energy to the area and they just, they just die. So that's, that's kind of creepy and weird, but that's, that's out there, that's just here. Okay, I actually missed this on my first playthrough, but for killing Adam Smasher, you get his key card. So when you go back into the game, that is on your person and you can actually go and open up his room on the Ebuniki. Now it's a bit of a novelty. There's not really anything in it that's any all that good. There is an iconic crafting spec, which is probably the best thing in there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just kind of a nice little thing. Okay, you might not have known this. It's kind of a nice touch, but you can actually call Jackie's phone and leave a message for him after he's passed away. I thought that was kind of a nice touch. Now, this next one, I asked Paolo about this in his stream and he straight up said he didn't think it was a reference, but I got the impression that he didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so I'm going to include it as something I've noticed that's an uncanny likeness to something. There's a certain gig um, where you have to go to a certain place, the something twister. And um, yeah, the, the, the name is uncannily familiar to the something twister in Tarantino's Dust Till Dawn. And what's more, the receptionist, his eyes are very red and almost demonic looking. Um, could it be the lighting? But I don't know. I just think uh, this, the, the whole vampire thing has to be some way inspired, I think. Powell said no, so I don't know. Okay, when you're playing the game Trouble in Haywood with River's niece and nephew, uh, there's a few Easter eggs in there. They've got a reference to Die Hard, Dirty Harry, and they also reference Lethal Weapon when the, I think it's the girl says, uh, I'm getting too old for this. 
This is a nice little one. It's basically the vault door. Uh, what's the vault door? Well, it's a door to a vault. If you go out into the Badlands just here, you will see there's a little round circular door and it is a reference and an Easter egg linking to Fallout and specifically the Vault 101. You can loot the people just here. And there you go, Vault 101 in all its glory. Pretty sure if I remember rightly, when I was playing Fallout 3, there were floaty robots in that. I could be imagining it, but anyway. So they've got their bits of piece. Look at the little toy gun next to him. So if you look at the note that they have, the conversation between Albert Cole and Gary Epps, so basically talking about a post-apocalyptic LARP. Obviously things didn't go as they're expected and things went horribly wrong here, but uh, yeah. They're trying to get away from video games and actually go and do something for real and they end up dead. <laughs> the, the, the moral to this story, yeah, developers want us to keep playing their games and not actually go out in the real world anymore. Anyway, moving on. Uh, this is a little sneaky one at the very start of the character creation screen. If you click on the fingerprint or thumbprint, I'm not entirely sure, you'll see and it switches to Johnny Silverhand and has Samurai as the backstory. And that's pretty cool. It's a, a very spoilerish. Imagine if you, uh, like me, into the game, didn't actually know uh, what was going to happen. And that was kind of interesting. Okay, this is one of my personal favorites. It's just a little thing. It's a three seashells. For anyone who grew up in the 80s and 90s and watched a lot of the action heroes, you'll be familiar with Demolition Man starring Sylvester Stallone. And uh, this is a nod to that. Look, I don't know if you guys know it, but you're... Uh... You're out of toilet paper. All right, this is just a little uh, hidden gem for you. Um, if you go to this location here and uh, go around the corner, there is a container behind the truck. This big old truck here. Okay, now to get into it, it has a strength check. So um, as long as you can pass that, you can get in. And inside you have a bit of stuff to loot. Um, and oh, whatever that is, um, I guess it's synth meat. It's absolutely disgusting, whatever it is, but you also get a capacity booster. And the message from uh, Chao Ming and is basically about uh, the meat being rancid. Uh, you can read it in your own time. And uh, the guy not wanting to eat in the restaurant is being sold to, it looks absolutely disgusting. But yeah, you can check that one out. Okay, the voice of Lizzy Wizzy, and this may be of interest to some of you, is the singer Grimes. I thought that was kind of cool. I've been reliably informed that not only is Grimes Lizzy Wizzy's voice actor, but she also sings her songs. So that's pretty cool. Gary the Prophet. Now, Gary the Prophet is someone that needs to be talked to repeatedly and given tips to unlock the full quest. It's a very interesting side gig. Um, basically, you'd listen to him mainly, and I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but just make sure you check in on Gary the Prophet frequently. Have a listen to him and wait for him to ask you questions. You'll get an option to tip him. I go ahead and tip him the max. You can do whatever, but do tip him something. Um, and then that's the interaction over. So go away and come back again and uh, keep doing that and see how things progress. That's all I gotta say. Um, basically, you're probably aware of him anyway, but he's Carnage, the Twitch streamer. So that's pretty cool, I thought. In Prophet's Thong, in Prophet's Song, it's very hard to say that without saying Prophet's Thong, but anyway, in Prophet's Song, uh, there is a chance to do a Monty Python reference. I admit, I didn't expect that. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! There's a few micro references in Lightning Breaks. The first one is when you say, and now for something completely different. Again, just like in Prophet's Song, that is a Monty Python reference. And now for something completely different. And when Johnny appears, he says, and now Panam, here's Johnny. Panam, we all know what that's referring to. John. That's The Shining. Later on in that same quest, when you're talking to Panam, yeah, your character turns around and says about turning it up to 11. That's a reference to Spinal Tap, or at least something was brought into common parlance or vernacular by a mockumentary about a, a rock group. Evidence of Abernathy's rampage. Okay, so if you're doing the Corpo life path, you'll hear about Abernathy at the start. She's gunning for Jenkins, who we find out gets taken out by her, as you can see. But further evidence of her rampage you can find just here on the side of the road where there is a crashed car and the message of somebody basically talking about it. So another victim of her cull, as it were. Just past this car, if you go and dive into the river, it actually took me a little bit of time to find this, but I was assured it was there, and it was, uh, you'll actually find the body of Carter, your assistant. That is actually who was in the car, and you see a conversation between him and his mom where he's basically saying, you don't know what this company is making me do, and she's like, they're paying you, stop complaining. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's an all too kind of familiar kind of conversation, isn't it? Okay, now this is a nice little one. I actually had no idea, um, but 
the scav den that you have to raid at the start on the job, the rescue. Um, that is room 1237. Now, that is a wink to The Shining, because in The Shining it was room 237. And uh, in that room you do find a lady in a bath. So, uh, there you go. On to the next one. The Little Mule. Now, why is this an Easter egg, you ask? Well, for any of you that are old enough to remember one of my favourite movies growing up, uh, well, I say favourite movies, one of my favourite movies to watch with my family, I suppose, uh, was Romancing the Stone. I love a good adventure movie. Um, it was very 80s. It was great fun. In it, there's a, I, I guess he's the leader of a, a kind of a drug cartel or something, but anyway, he, he, he's, he has a black Ford truck with tires in the back and he calls it my little mule, a Pepe, and uh, this is, there has to be a nod to that. I, I'm not entirely sure, but as far as I'm concerned, this is uh, a nod to that. And this is one of my, look at this. Love it. Anyway, <laughs> next he's Okay, this is another car uh, Easter egg. Um, uh, this is actually one of my favorite cars in the whole game because I grew up with the Dukes of Hazard when it was was what it was. Okay, it was two guys driving around in a car, sliding over bonnets, and uh, yeah, and basically this is a nod to that very famous car, the General Lee. Uh, so this has the new USA flag on top. It has the same orange color, and it's the same kind of muscle car. You can see it here, jumping in the intro of the Dukes of Hazard. And you get it from uh, Muammar Captain Reyes, El Capitan Reyes, and it's just down here. It's the Type 66 640 TS, and uh, yeah, it's an excellent looking car. And it's actually called the Gen Rowley. All right, so just to confirm, it's not my imagination. Okay, next. Now, Okami, you can see the wolf's head going by here during this scene, and you see it then later on in the actual parade, and on the side of the boat, it's actually written Okami. Now, Okami in Japanese is great god or great spirit, so it's not necessarily the game, uh, although the game is probably the most famous use of the word Okami in the West, so, uh, you know, it's very possible that, and obviously Okami in the game is a wolf. I noticed something at the end which was very interesting in Where Is My Mind? Takamura lies to you. He initially says that he wasn't sent by Hanako, that she'd moved on and forgotten about you. He later goes on to say how Hanako sent him. Thought that was interesting. I don't know if it was just an error in the scripting or whether that said something to intentions there. Here's a nice little uh, hidden gem. The Wraith Camp where you rescue Saul from. Uh, if you just go behind that and you dive into the water, you'll find somebody with a sword stuck in him and uh, some stuff to loot. So it's just a little kind of hidden gem there. You will definitely have missed this if you didn't do the Corpo starting missions or play as a Corpo at all. Basically, you get Corpo conversation options and um, pretty much unilaterally they make you behave like an asshole. I just thought that things. Who asked you to think? Excuse me? I know damn well it wasn't me. Who was it? I mean, I would never speak to someone like this. I was horrified. <laughs> I can't believe it. You are an absolute D-bag. Anyway. Also on the Corpo playthrough, when you're done talking to Jenkins at the start, as you're heading out, you get accosted by uh, one of your subordinates, uh, Carter, and he basically asks you about some reports. And again, you can be very douchey. Um, it's terrible, but if you ask for the reports, he actually sends them to you. So what you have to do, you have to pop back in and uh, you can read the computer and it says there, read the report on your personal terminal optional. I didn't actually notice that when I was playing. And there you go, he's actually sent them. I thought that was a really nice touch. When you sit down at your desk, in your drawer, you've got a magazine, Retro Gaming, that has Witcher 3 and Siri. So it firmly plants this in our future. A little number reference. Again, this is Compeki Plaza. This is when you're doing the heist. Uh, the floor you go to for the apartments is 42. This could be two things. One, 42 is very famously the meaning of life. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So it could be referring to that, very appropriate in this situation. And it's also level 42, level 42 is a group. It's possibly that, but I think it's probably more likely 42 being that kind of meaning of life number. Thank you, Josh Duckworth. I've seen that button so many times, but I have not registered the correlation. Hideo Kojima. Yes, he is actually in the game. So yeah, he's just having a chat. It's again on the quest, the heist. Um, when you go into the bar, it's optional to check out the hotel bar. Optional things are always worthwhile doing. Because you never know what you're going to find. In this case, you find 
Hideo Kojima. Now this one was pointed out to be by one of my subscribers. Thank you so much for this, Yanni Kappa. Awesome. Um, basically, Morally is the brand of cigarettes that Ruby and Johnny and other people in the game smoke. You can see it here in the quest chipping in just after the car crash when she hands you the packet. This is an Easter egg or a, a notable at least because Morley is a brand made famous by the X-Files. It's been kind of adopted by the movies and TV as their fake brand cigarettes that people use. Um, it was the original brand smoked by the cigarette smoking man. I'm not endorsing smoking or anything, of course, but I just like the reference. I'm going to put this in because it's possible. I don't think it actually is, but maybe it is and somebody's mentioned it to me. Here we go. And um, yeah, I don't want to ignore it. This possibly is Duke Nukem. Buzz cut, red tank top, you know, the kind of, it has, does have a little bit of a look of the Duke. Shake it, baby. And if you're still enjoying this, of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. So yeah, I hope at least there's been something so far, but uh, if not, let's keep on going and see what we can find. This was a nice little one. You will notice in the Path of Glory with Rogue, which also leads to A New Dawn Fades. Yeah, when you wake up from your 20 hour slumber, take a look around Rogue's room and you'll see a photo frame with Rogue, Johnny Silverhand and Mike Pondsmith. Now, there are a few different Pondsmith references in the game. He's even on the radio. Maximum Mike, I believe that's him. And the streets named after milk and his little things. So, yeah. Now, I actually had to go out of my way and replay through the pickup and the heist and all that comes after until you get back to free roam just to get this footage. Um, there's a number of things you can do during the pickup quest. For example, telling them about the demon on Meredith's money chip or basically betraying Meredith. Uh, when you go outside, if you meet Gilchrist instead of Meredith, that means she has been quote unquote dealt with and you'll find her uh, basically, I don't know why her head has been shaved, but her head's been shaved anyway. So uh, when I first saw it, I wasn't sure it was her, but it is definitely her. Uh, it's confirmed by a conversation you have with Johnny. Rough way to go. But yeah, that's, that's what happens to Meredith anyway. Batty's Hotel. Now, this is another Easter egg and not to a sci-fi movie, which is a huge influence. And this is... Uh, Blade Runner and Batty is a character Roy Batty in it and the origami motif there is also uh, a reference to that I think also um, maybe it's uh, having you know Batty Hotel is close to Bates Motel perhaps I don't know maybe a psycho reference but more or less it's it's just Blade Runner because the origami absolutely confirms it and if you go to this area here If you head up in the elevator and look at that thing going over, you just imagine that saying, you know, off world vacations or something like that, colonies. And if we go out to the top, you'll find a man sitting here, or I say man, he's a replicant and his name is Roy Batty and he's holding the pigeon. It's basically Rukahara's character at the end of Blade Runner when he's doing his tears in the rain monologue and look at those bits on the edge. There. That's where Harrison Ford's character Deckard would have been holding on for dear life. A really special one, that one. This girl in Razor's Quest, she is easily missed. If you turn down Coach when he has a proposition, you won't actually talk to her. Um, but if you hear him out at least and you follow him over, um, once you're done talking to him, whatever you have said to him, it doesn't matter. Uh, she will call you over. You can have a little chat with her. It's optional. It's all blue. Um, and, and she basically kind of gives you a bit of a stop story. But here's what's interesting. At the end, you see her and she's talking about what a good actor she was, that she somehow played you. I don't understand how she played you. Like, you're going to fight to win anyway. Um, it doesn't make sense. But what really doesn't make sense is the fact that she's holding a remote control or a radio control. It's the kind that you would use for a radio controlled car, plane or robot. Is Razor a robot? I don't know, but it's been on my mind for a long time, this one. Now, there's a job that's easily missed, at least it used to be. You go into a clothes shop, it's the Jinguji store in city center. And while you're in there, talk to the guy. And once you've exhausted all the conversation anyway, you'll you'll notice, I think the second time you go in, you'll know it's gonna happen. He actually has security guards in the place, but a cyber psycho will burst into the place and you'll have a little quest there called Bullets. Anyway, the max tech officer that turns up is Melissa Rory. She is the cyber psycho from the trailer. The quest, unfortunately, is quite buggy. It's quite glitchy they don't turn up until you take down the cyber psycho and she walks in and she talks as if she's the person that's taken down the cyber psycho um but uh either way it's, it's a nice touch including her in it um i think and it's further confirmed later you get a text from the clerk the sales assistant he sends you a text message with the gossip confirming that's who she was okay there is a series of quests um again this is one you 
previously could have missed if it was back in the early days. Um, there's a Zen master who basically takes you on some meditative journeys. You can opt to pay him each time and the the amount you pay him is actually the Fibonacci. Well, it's not the it's not the Fibonacci sequence right from the start, but it's like a, it's like the 13th, 14th, 15th and 16th numbers from the Fibonacci sequence. And there's a nice touch. I thought uh, I, was, I thought it was a strange amount. So that's what it turned out to be. Hell Lake 3. I don't know whether it was cut content or not, but basically there's a film set with um, a lake full of, uh, I guess, mannequins. Um, basically, it was about how filming got uh, cancelled and they just kind of left everything there. But it's, it's just out here in the desert. You can find it. OK, this was actually pointed out by one of my viewers, Keaton Nunyabiz. <laughs> Great name. Basically, that um, on both of the kind of lore relevant vehicles, the Hella and the TurboTech. But on the back of both these vehicles, you have a sticker or a vinyl of Roach. It's properly Roach, a cartoon version of it. It's really awesome. I had no idea. So thank you very much, Keaton. Moving on. GLaDOS. OK, this is awesome. The voice actor that plays GLaDOS also plays one of the Delamain cats. But not only is it the same person playing it, it's actually GLaDOS. And she tries to kill you. It's brilliant. It's excellent. Uh, really good. And she also mentions cake. It's a little obvious to mention cake, but at the same time, I liked this one a lot. The iconic car from the promo footage and from screenshots of V standing against it was the Quadra Type R. And you can actually get that, but you have to do a gig in order to unlock it. The gig is a life's work. And about a day after, you'll get a text message from Jake giving you a job called Sex on Wheels. And basically, it's to go and pick this car up and you get it. The thing handles like an, it, like on a gear shift, it loses traction. It's crazy, but it's fun. And it's at the iconic one. So there's one of the two that has Roach on the back of it. Now, this is one I'm looking for your input on. This guy has a bomb bag and it has Rush on it. Now, the only Rush thing I can think of is the band Rush. And it would be interesting if he had a bomb bag, which was Rush. It's not the logo of the band, um, but it just seems interesting that he's got a bomb bag with Rush on it and he's kind of involved in the music industry and his name is Spectre. So, um, yeah, I don't know, but uh, somebody might have an idea what this is, but uh, maybe it's nothing. So, but uh, yeah, let me know in the comments below. Oh, check out this one. Dandelion cocktails. So there's a bar named after Dandelion. <laughs> That's a nice nod. So another thing that most people wouldn't see is this car. You can only get this car if you betray Pan Am. So on Terrible with a little idea. help from my friends. Obvious. If you turn down Sorry, the mission and you don't go and off. you then go and rat out Pan Am to Sol. Yeah, basically Sway, you Cassidy, Carol, torpedo any others. chance you have at either romancing Pan Am or doing any of her follow-up quests. Fuck me! How could you? Hey, uh... Which is lunacy considering Seriously, what a good no. end quest the Alda Caldos one is and Queen of the Highway, all this. They're, they're all great quests. You basically lock yourself out of an entire ending and a romance I'm option. So gone. But consolation prize, Sol does give you a car. Now, you can get a blue version of this car and it's exactly the same. So it, I, I think most people won't have seen this because most of us love doing the quests and we don't want to freeze ourselves out of any quests for any particular reason. So anyway, there you go. So you probably didn't even see that car. I certainly didn't until I saw the videos about it. Okay, after doing Kerry Uridine's quest line, um, there are a couple of extra joy toys that open up. If that's your thing, if you want to, you know, check it out, this is where you find them. Oh, there's a bit of dialogue that a character has outside of Arasaka Tower, where she's talking about the Witching Day and the Witch's Sabbath. Ever heard of Triple Witching Day? This is a little micro note to the crones, or the three witches and their Sabbath in uh, The Witcher 3. Now, it's been a while, a long, long while since I played The Witcher 3. I'm still waiting, so I'm not entirely sure what the reference is exactly supposed to mean, but um, it's kind of, it's an interesting conversation anyway. The Witching Day? You wish. You're in for a whole damn witch's Sabbath. This is pretty clever, actually. Um, you, this is very easy to miss. The Russian fixer, who appears in the gig from Regina Jones, where you have to put the tracker on the car. The uh, same person appears in the quest fixer, merc, soldier, spy. And there's two people in the apartment when you go there. You can sneak around and not interact with them at all, or you can uh, subdue them or kill them if you want. I just subdued them. And they happen to be the same people who you pass in Compeki Plaza when you are heading up to your room with Jackie. Now, um, if you do this gig before you go to Compeki Plaza and you take them out, well, they won't be there. 
I think one of my favorite fixer rewards um, you get from Dino, you'll get a quest from Dino called Gas, 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 and basically you just go and pick it up. It's a Quadra Type 66 640 TS. It's got that same green that Steve McQueen's Mustang from Bullet had, so you can kind of get the vibe from that one. I think it's awesome. This one was brought to me by Galdino Pedron, one of my subscribers. Um, basically, it is probably one of the darkest Easter eggs. Oh, I know, with all the dead bodies and stuff, I got how could this be dark? But it's pretty dark. In the gig Jeopardy in Haywood, where you have to sneak in to a funeral home, uh, you can actually hack the hologram of the person who they're mourning. And yeah, this is the result. <laughs> Anna Hamill. This isn't the only occurrence of this kind of thing, but I wanted to share it with you. If you do this little assault in progress here, and these world events can be easily avoided and missed, and you know, you probably still have some remaining yourself, uh, but they are not just random events. And sometimes if you take a look at this conversation here between Evan Flakes and Martha Flakes, um, you hear that Evan Flakes basically told Anna Hamill all he knows. And as you know, Anna Hamill is the person who's doing the investigation in Kabuki, who you have to scare off in the gig, The Woman of La Mancha. So um, there's a nice little cross reference there. And you'd never know about that if you don't do that NCPD hustle. So it's worthwhile doing them because they are the, a lot of them are connected and it's kind of cool. I noticed this one in my most recent playthrough, actually. Um, I hadn't spotted it before because I'd never failed the quest. There's a quest you get at the very end of Karyuridine's quest line, every breath you take, where you have to protect one of the Uscrack girls from a stalker. If you fail to protect her, Red Menace will actually take out the stalker and come down um, and kind of, you know, be all upset with you and stuff, understandably, because you failed. Um, Blue Moon tells you about Red Menace keeping watch from up above. So if you have a look here, that's where she is standing, and she's got a sniper rifle. She's a good shot too. Better shot than V, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Okay, next. This is the GTA or Grand Theft Auto San Andreas reference. Unmistakable. Now there's a bit in the game, I remember it, I won't say fondly, uh, with your bike and a train. I failed so many times. So this one, <laughs> this one holds a special place in my heart. I mean, this is a really great thing about the Quest uh, writers and the people who have actually put this game together. They've got such a reverence for other games and such respect and such a healthy love for games and movies that they, they put all these kind of things in. It's brilliant. All we had to do was follow the damn train, CJ. Okay, something you probably didn't notice, uh, the Hollow Dancers. This is more of a didn't notice than an Easter egg, but uh, if you're not happy with the Hollow Dancer, you can actually change. You can cycle through different Hollow Dancers. You know, if you want to, I mean, why wouldn't you want to? Uh, there's no male hollow dancers, they're all women for some reason. So uh, yeah, you have a cycle through and I think it's random um, or there's a limited amount. I'm not sure, I didn't spend too long checking it out, but there you go. So yeah, you can uh, cycle through them. <laughs> Moving on. The Thornton Colby that you get very early on has a nod to Gun in 60 Seconds. If you have a look at it there, it says it belonged to some carjacker from Memphis, a certain Nicholas, may he rest in peace. So uh, that would be uh, Nicholas Cage in Gone in 60 Seconds. Okay, this is an important one, I think. Okay, so there is a place in uh, Japantown, Mega Building H8, just outside. Um, there's no quest icon to start with, but you'll notice this spontaneous craving satisfaction machine. Uh, Brendan, he's chatting away to the maintenance guy and um, yeah, pay attention to him. Nice little double Easter egg about this is that the voice actor is the same voice actor that plays the android Connor in Detroit Become Human. So it's kind of a double whammy with that one, which is pretty cool. And you go back to him repeatedly and he has follow up quests. I can see clearly now and um, spray paint and things like that. And they all lead to a conclusion. Very, very worthwhile doing. Hits me in the feels every time. Okay, next up we have a, just a small little reference to a movie called Kick-Ass. You're probably familiar with it. If you go to this location here in Pacifica and you just look over the edge and drop down, you will see he's there. And uh, he has his two stun buttons there and and a little conversation between himself, John Butt Kicker and uh, Linda Grace. So there you go. We're checking out, have a read of it. And now this is a funky little one edited in 1.5. I really do like this one. At least it was discovered after 1.5. That doesn't necessarily mean it was put in 1.5, but I'm fairly certain it was. Uh, or at least activate it. It, uh, yeah, basically it's a light switch and it says don't touch after dark. Uh, now, there's no real consequences to it that I've discovered yet. Cars don't suddenly start crashing, although I think I notice more horns. It could be my imagination, but basically, yeah, it turns the lights on and off on the street. <laughs> it's just one little button in the middle of town. It's a bit daft, really, but it's good fun. Okay, you're gonna hate me, 
but I, ha I have to put this in. Um, <laughs> more to my belief that Razor is a robot. Look at this, red versus blue. Look, the guy on the left is clearly hued blue and Razor's clearly got a red color to him. Um, I'm just thinking rock and sock and robots. They were red versus blue robots, right? Take a look, yeah. So, I mean, still, it's more clues that Razor is actually a robot. I, my imagination probably, but still. I still think it's a thing. I'm, that's unconfirmed, but I believe it. I really believe it now. That red and blue poster. Yeah. All right, we're 30 minutes in. Still with me? That's cool. Fair play. Hey, if you're enjoying this, don't forget to throw me a like. That would help me out. And if you want to be kept up to date with other videos, don't forget to subscribe. Let's get on with it. Now, this is uh, a personal opinion. Let me know down below if you disagree with me or not. I reckon this is Geralt. Uh, this billboard here, you can find it in several places, the Jinguji billboard, has a picture of a guy who looks very Geraltish. He's got a wolf pelt around him and he's stuck with needles. And I'm thinking modern day equivalent of potions, perhaps. And just to further my theory, you can find another Jinguji one with a lovely redheaded lady. I'm not sure if she's still with us or not, uh, but either way, I reckon that's Triss Marigold. That's my opinion. Um, and I'm sticking with it. Easter eggs. Love them. Okay. So as another movie reference Easter egg, they have some Matrix ones. Here's a couple of them now. We have lots of clothes. There's a scene in uh, The Matrix where they say we need guns. Lots of guns. And the shelving flies out just like that. So that's exactly what that's referring to. Big white space. Yeah. Got some meds for you. Again, Matrix blockers. reference, I believe, but the whole red pill, blue pill thing. It's a motif in a lot of things, but um, I think in this case, it's Quiet. fairly safe to say, you know, when we're dealing Zero with reality, from me. then that's a matrix Effects reference. Will be opposite. It'll speed things up. This one is fairly obvious probably to you, uh, but I'm going to let you know anyway, this is a Half-Life 3 reference. Um, basically, no Life 3, it doesn't exist. It works on so many levels, but basically it is referring to Half-Life 3. And just to confirm things, if you look at the review chart, it really takes the piss. After 50 long years, the wait is finally over. It also references scientist Baron Freemanschk, Alice and the crowbar. So it's, it's Half-Life 3 confirmed. This next one is probably more of a personal opinion, but I reckon the training bot here, the training robot that Coach has, is a nod to real still. He has a very similar look, I reckon, and um, in addition to that, Coach takes the piss saying he found him and took him in and clothed him and fed him, which is kind of what happens in real still, you know, they, they find him in a trash heap. So I think, I mean, it very much looks like him, and I think that's basically saying, yeah, that's our inspiration for this. That's my opinion on this one. I don't actually know if it's a fact or not. Another subtle little Easter egg from The Witcher stable. Literally, this is an arcade game called Roach Race. Roach is Witcher's horse, and it also has a griffin on it too. You probably didn't miss this, but just in case, when you first come out of your apartment, uh, Wilson will holler at you from Second Amendment Gun Store, and you'll get a quest called The Gun. That's to go and pick up your gun. Maybe it's still sitting in your quest inventory. I think it's important to get it done straight away because the Dying Knight's a nice pistol to start off with and it's very upgradable. But uh, if you miss it and you come back to this quest later, compared to any weapons you have by that time, you may as well have just missed it altogether. So pop in and get that as soon as you get a chance. It's a nice little pistol. Kongu, uh, that's your Nobu's pistol. Again, it's easily missed. It's on his chest of drawers. Grab that as soon as you go into the penthouse during the heist. The DTR container. This is just another hidden gem for you. Again, this is in Watson, just where there's this fight going on. Uh, you'll see this DTR sign and there's another openable blue container with a force check. So go ahead and open it up. There's plenty of eddies to be grabbed. There's a crafting spec for a mod. And uh, there's a bit of an email chain from Kelly Miller to Tanner Sheridan discussing the plan. Now, this probably has some kind of reference. I haven't found out what the reference is linked to but either way it's a, a nice little easter egg and some loot to find a nice little stash looks like they were about to rip off dtr satori i'm not going to go into this one in detail but basically during the heist you go up onto the platform above your nobu's apartment you have to wait till all the cutscenes are done first and uh t-bug unlocks the doors and going up if you want a full play-by-play -play on this check out my katana videos where i go into this in detail but it's definitely a katana you do not want to miss since 1.5, you can do burnouts. Um, if you hold brake and accelerate at the same time, you do burnouts. And then if you turn, you can do donuts. It's pretty cool. Um, it makes actually turning a bike way easier as well. You can kind of drift a little bit as well, which is great. So yeah, the car handling, if you haven't played since prior to 1.5 and you're coming back to it, you're gonna notice that. 
Okay, Terminator 2. I'm really glad to see that it didn't escape being referenced in this. If you go to this area here and um, have a look in this, what do you call these things? I guess they're sewer drains, uh, something like that. You know, the ones that the, they seem to race cars on in old movies like Grease. If you have a look here, there's actually a crashed truck and there's a motorbike and there's a robot. He's got dark speed square sunglasses, a shotgun. It's like a, an alternate outcome of what happened in Terminator 2 during that scene. Okay, so we've got Arnold, Jimmy O'Connor. It's all there. It's definitely a T2 reference. Very good, I think. Okay, uh, this one is a... Uh, I'm just going to call this one Disco Robot. Thanks, Russell. It's a dancing robot and he is located in Kabuki. You need a tech skill of five to turn him on and once you do um get ready to fight no just just get ready to dance um he's playing some tunes oh look he's got some vinyls in the back uh yeah it's just a nice little easter egg so you, if you don't have the tech score and you pretty much should probably have that easily you you won't be able to interact with them uh but there you go it's just a bit of fun uh, moving on okay next up we have the dev room i expect you would all know this one it's basically a secret room in Kabuki Market. And it's this ring area here. You just go all the way around to the side. Johnny pops up. He challenges you to get inside. And uh, the only way you can do it is if you have the code. Now, um, I bought a digital version of the game because I wanted it straight away. It was actually on one of the bits of media inside the physical copy of the book. And uh, yeah, it takes a bit of a leap to actually know that that's what the code is for. But there you go. So once you go inside, it's got that really cool samurai wall art there. Once you're done having a look around, you can sit down with Johnny. He'll play some music for a while while you can look at a video screen of all the people involved in making the game. So it's just a nod to all the developers and stuff. So that's pretty cool, I thought. Johnny seems to like it too. I wonder, is there anything more to this room? We'll find out in due time, I expect. Oh, this one made me laugh now. Uh, during the quest where you are hiding out from the storm with Panam and Sol, there is a bottle of whiskey on the table. You don't have to scan it, but I, I figured I'd scan it. Yeah. And it comes up as questionable Double. whiskey. <laughs> and, uh, oh, let's just have a look. So it comes up as questionable whiskey and straddling the line between alcohol and a bioweapon. Untested on taste buds. Like, is this even safe? Only one way to find out. I think that's brilliant. One of my favorite tattoos of Judy's. Uh, this is a nice Easter egg as well. It's a shark with a freaking laser beam attached to its head. So I'm pretty certain that's an Austin Powers nod. Maybe it's not, but it's awesome anyway. What do we have? Sea bass. Now, I asked for uh, assistance on this one before, and some of you made a couple of good suggestions. And one of them, which I quite like, and I think it's very possible, is it might be a nod to Sherlock Holmes. People were thinking it might have been study in pink because the pink suitcase in that and the pills. It's the best explanation I've heard so far. It still could just be a random thing. Anyway, what the hell? A bottle rolling from nowhere. That's just bizarre. I keep expecting Swamp Thing to emerge from that. This is a neat little Easter egg. Um, it's mainly just a name. If you're familiar with the film Pulp Fiction, Bruce Willis's character, his name is Coolidge, and he takes a wad of money from, I think it's the Mafia, and he bets on himself to win the fight when he's supposed to be throwing it for them, so he has to leave town. And that's what this is referring to here. I thought it was really cool, uh, because it's the same situation for this guy they're looking for, Coolidge, and you're not actually dealing with Coolidge in this. They're interrogating some hard-as-nails guy. It happens to be his coach, and if you love the conversation there, it's quite funny. <laughs> And um, yeah, they can't they can find him. So that was a nice little Pulp Fiction reference. This one was brought to me by one of my viewers, Vini Redun. And um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Basically, um, on the Corpo life path at the start, this is something I've missed. I'm going to share it with you. Thanks to Vinny or Vini. If you go onto V's computer and you go onto the internet, you'll see it's actually the Arasaka intranet. And it has a whole load of different places you can visit. One of which gives you V's staff information and things like that. So it's kind of cool. Oh, this is fun. Um, I don't know if you spotted on one of the computers in the marina the names for the different yachts. I love a good uh, dad joke and, <laughs> I, I, and these are brilliant. Arterly Fabulous 3, Seal of Trust, Bodie McBoatface Jr, Oxbridge Regatta. Yeah, I just thought the, the, the first three were brilliant. Seal of Trust. I mean, come on. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, I like little things like that. Okay, just a, a few things from now. This one's a bit of a downer, but uh, the Columbarium has a few other names worth checking out. So you've got a memorial to Jackie Wells there. It says, good night, sweet prince. Yeah, this one goes back. Oh, I guess it probably Shakespeare would be the first time it's Hamlet, but it's used for so many things. One of the things that sticks in my mind is when Wesley Snipes yeah, says it in uh, Demolition Man. It might have also been in Robocop when they're uh, taking out Murphy at the very start 
Um, but either way, it's used a lot. It's used online as well. Good night, sweet prince. I don't know if you guys can hear the rain, but really sorry about that if you can. It's raining on the Velux windows. Okay, we also have a memorial to Brick, which is funny because that's there even if you save Brick. So I don't know if that's a glitch or whether basically somebody had planned his death and had that ready for him. I'm not entirely sure. There's Arthur Jenkins. He was your boss at the start of the Corpo Life Path. You have Antonio Perales, who is Jefferson Perales' brother that he was made to forget about, who I believe is actually Mr. Blue Eyes and this, his death has been faked. You have Roy Batty, um, obviously, again, another Blade Runner reference. This is Roy Batty. There's his quote from the end of the movie. All these moments will be lost in time like tears in rain. Okay, now this is interesting as well because this is the memorial to Johnny and Alt. So you have Alt Cunningham and Robert John Linder. That is Johnny Silverhand's real name. And there you go. So that's all the ones from the Columbarium. And just for a fun one, just to lighten things up after that. The robots, you're probably all familiar with this one as well, but I wanted to include it. These are the robots playing cards in the apartment next to the north side apartment. It's just a fun little thing. Again, there is a strength check on the door to get in. There is also authorization. I don't know where to find the authorization, but uh, you know, it doesn't take that much strength to open and there you go. Um, I'm not sure the cards they're playing with are very good. They all have one pip in the middle, so they all look like aces even though they're not. But uh, yeah, they seem to know what they're doing. There's probably some deeper meaning behind these guys. They probably have a reference to someone. If you look at them, they have names and everything. They're night city citizens. They're not just robots. And that one apparently has lungs. Crazy. Okay, there's a nifty little John Wick reference. On the gig Olive Branch, when you're talking to Sergei, uh, you basically ask him about the situation and what's going on, and he starts into a little story about what happened. So he describes the guy as having a beard, brown shoes, nothing breathtaking. I think we know who he's referring to. And he has a little dog. You know where this is going. So yeah, it's uh, very easy to miss. But yeah, also very neat. Um, okay, the iguana. Now, this is on the mission The Heist. You can actually get this at any stage while you're in Yorinobu's apartment. If you look really closely, look at that little glow. That is an iguana egg. So what you gotta do, so you grab it and you head out. And later on, when you're in your apartment, uh, there's a little place where you can drop it or place it. And you have to wait time. I think it's about between 30 and 60 in-game days for it to hatch. And um, well, I'll leave that little surprise for you. Moving swiftly on. Uh, this is on a gig called Serious Side Effects, and uh, there's one room if you have a high enough strength uh, ability, you can open the door and, uh, yeah. Something about this robot, <laughs> just, ah, oh, just, um, Elliot Hopkins and Sean Graham, enjoy for a second, I'm going to be quiet. And, um, yeah, it is what it is, good job devs, good job. Here's a little Blade Runner thing that everybody knows in a way it's a nod, it's an easter egg as well. If you're a fan, you'll be familiar with Pris, a character in Blade Runner who was portrayed by Daryl Hannah. And um, I think it's no coincidence that Misty looks very much like Pris. I think it's intentional. Well, I'll call, of course it's intentional, but uh, yeah, it's just really cool. I think uh, if you didn't know that and you'd not seen the movie and you watch it, you would notice the likeness straight away. It's very good. Okay, um, uh, it's now called Night Moves, but there was a quest called, uh, was it Burning Desire, I think it was, and Flaming Crotch Man in it. Um, this is actually played by a YouTuber called Jesse Cox. I was not aware of this playing this first time through, but uh, yeah, I uh, I think that's kind of cool. So yeah, maybe one day, look, let's get on with it. An unmistakable reference to Hideo Kojima's Death Stranding, you have a bridge baby. Now this is in one of the darker and more difficult to get through quests, The Hunt. Um, it's early on when you're searching through the facility and you're looking for the guy that's in a coma because you want to question him. Yeah, so anyway, I'll let you find where it is so you can have a close look yourself. But yeah, it, it isn't like an homage. It isn't using the in-game assets to represent something. This is the actual model of the bridge baby from Death Stranding. I think it's awesome, but at the same time, uh, sometimes I'm not so sure about these ones, whether or not they should be included, because it really does take you out of the game. It's one thing having something that's a reference to something and work outable, but having something that's from another game, which is in a different timeline or a different universe. I find it a little immersion breaking, but that's OK. I don't know. I'm conflicted. Let's move on anyway. Uh, when I was messing about along the border, I... Uh... I was trying to find another way around because there used to be a hole in the wall and I came across this border patrol car and a uh, murdered officer with a shard you can read. I was hoping it would let me sneak through the border crossing, but uh, no, no, uh, it didn't. Um, 
had to run away pretty quick. But if you want to go around role playing Border Patrol, if that's your thing, well, there, you, you can get it. It's got a really cool siren, too. While I was playing with this, I uh, stopped off at the petrol station. I was getting my role play on, and um, or the gas station, service station, whatever you want to call it. And um, I, uh, I decided I'd blow up said service station because it seemed like a thing to do. But I did it whilst I was using my Kiroshi optics, and in slow motion, the explosions look amazing. So maybe you didn't actually see any slow motion explosions in the game, but look at that shockwave! Amazing, I loved it. Anyway. The new blade glow. Now, I still don't know if this is just me. Let me know in the comments below. But the glow on the mantis blades is absolutely incredible now. I mean, it looks amazing. It's like you've got dual wield lightsabers on your wrists. It's amazing. I mean, look at this. I mean, it makes me want to do a whole mantis blade playthrough. I mean, look at this. It's crazy. Look at the glow. Now, I haven't changed any settings in particular, but it just looks so good. But um, basically, um, if you want to get this, you go into your cyberware, uh, you go into the Mantis Blade, and you uh, equip the mod for it, the thermal damage. But if you want to look at the electrical damage as well, the physical damage doesn't look great, but the electrical damage, check it out, also looks amazing now. Look at the reflection on your Kuroshis and Man, there was some setting that was changed or something that was amped up, and things look absolutely gorgeous since 1.5. And yeah, wow amazing okay this is a neat little one um i <laughs> i think so anyway void if removed when you wake up in again spoilers when you wake up in the trash heap you have a tv on top of you um and you have to remove it and the only option is to remove it but as always there's a warranty sticker on your appliance here that says warranty void if removed so we have to remove now i know we're not removing the sticker but i think it was intentionally put there nice and clearly for us to see it kind of you know if we go ahead our warranty is void we could stay here probably never remove it and we'll be fine or <laughs> your pet cat now like with the iguana you can also get a pet cat now the pet cat is a little easier to find you just go out from your apartment turn left and go around the corner and there's a bowl there and a note saying feed the cat or feed tech cat um, I have no idea what kind of food that is you're feeding it. That's disgusting. But either way, it's all you get. So you go away for uh, 24 hours, you come back and the cat is there. And look, hey look, see that? Uh, it's called a cat, Johnny. So anyway, you, you take the cat and you get a little cutscene and you take it into your house. It's quite cute, actually. And you put him in a little wash basket. Oh... Uh... Well, he's such a cute. There it is. Ah, and there's Johnny again. <laughs> I think he likes his pets. When you come back to the apartment, the cat is in different places. Where's he gone? There he is. Look, look at that. He's eaten. Oh, that looks like a much better bowl of food. Now, I'm still not entirely sure what it is. But yeah, anytime you go out, you come back. He's in a different place. And even when you look in the mirror, there you go. So when you look in the mirror, look, you see the cat there as well. And it's so interesting looking at the cat. And you don't even notice that it's Johnny Silverhand. Look, a little bonus Easter egg there. When you look in the mirror during a relic glitch you will see johnny silverhand in the mirror if you've never done that you won't know it or you might have seen it somewhere else now this is a neat little one you'll come across this area this is the upper market in uh, japan town and um you can actually find this area while while you're doing the quest that involves the parade there's a door here as you can see it's got a technical ability check of 11 i have to have it here so i can go ahead and open it but if you weren't playing tech and you wanted to get in there uh you would have to either spend the skill on tech or work out another way in now there's a keypad and if you have a look here this door says 06 Okay, and if we go out here, this door says 29. Now, this is this was a huge leap, but uh, yeah, you put those codes together, you get the code to open the door. And this is where you get the smart pistol Genji Road. There's actually another place you can get it as well. Uh, I can't remember where, but I'll come across it later. Well, where are we at? We, we must, that is like 100. If you're still with me, that's incredible. Thank you notice of expiration when you're doing the quest many ways to skin a cat oh, there's a cat theme going on now isn't there you come across a shard called notice of expiration and it basically has uh, information as you can see here about a large locked freezer with instructions do not open and a 50 euro contract basically uh, you'll find this later uh, but this refers to the fridge that we later find bart moss in and uh, yeah it's just a nice little you know, the first time I saw that, I had no idea. But then after doing the quest and I saw this the second time around, ah, I was like, that's Bartmos. All right, this is not one for the faint hearted. Uh, I like to call this one uh, Balcony 20.5. We're on Balcony number 20 and the next stop on the elevator is Balcony 21. Now, 
if you have a look, there is a floor in between, as I like to call it balcony 20.5. So it's right here in the Redwood Market. Uh, you'll come across this area when you're doing uh, one of the requests. So as you can see, if you go up to balcony 21 and we drop down to the balcony down below, ta-da, it's a different balcony. It isn't the one we were just on. And check out this. I don't think you can see this anywhere else in the game. <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous. Oh, I, 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 this is, look at the state. I mean, I mean, hats off to whoever designed this in the game. What the hell was that one? Was that apple juice? I just, taser. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's all I have to say on that one. Okay, this is a nice little one. Uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Um, I'm a little disappointed it is specifically a Mad Max Fury Road reference as opposed to the OG Mad Max, but it is what it is and it's still awesome. It's the uh, the tanker that Furiosa is driving. I think it's Furiosa, but uh, like even with the, if you look at the conversation between Dakota and the lady here, who look, if we look at her face, can clearly see she's been made to look like Charlize Theron's character. Her name is actually Charlize, so it's a little bit of an obvious one, but it's uh, it's still pretty cool. It's easy to miss. I mean, you don't spend that much time around biotechnical labs. It seems like a very underutilized part of the game, to be honest with you, but anyway, it is what it is. So uh, you might not have noticed this, but when you get into the elevator for the first time, and you're heading up to your apartment, there's a TV show, a chat show on, and they happen to be talking about um, some tech. Had no idea when I first played this, but yeah, this is the relic they're talking about. It's nice to sit and listen to the TV sometimes. There's some great foreshadowing in things um, and in conversations. It's great. At this rate, I'd be amazed if there's not another 50 to 100 Easter eggs still yet to be discovered. Let's get on with it. Okay, so this is in the music store right in the center of the city. There's a place where I do a lot of my uh, crafting tutorials just because I like the ambiance there. Um, if you check out this poster here, does that look a little bit like Adam Jensen from Deus Ex to you? I think that might be who it is. I'm not sure, but yeah, it would be strange not to have some Deus Ex references. And speaking of Deus Ex references, if you sneak down into the gig, the Heisenberg Principle, that is actually uh, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, and you listen to them speaking, they talk about another drug. So yeah, while they're discussing the name of the product, one of the Tiger Claws asks why it's called Glitter, and the other one says that they wanted to call it Neon, but that name already exists. So yeah, that's another little Deus Ex reference. Thank you to Diamond Soul for mentioning that one. Okay, if you want to get this red sword, um, it's not particularly special, but it does look amazing. It's in this loading screen and the promo shots. Then all you have to do, um, well, there's a couple of places, but the place I get it from is from the Cyber Psycho mission, Phantom of Night City. Okay, something I noticed about the uh, about many of the Ripper Docks is they have a sign out the front saying Rider. Uh, when you finally agree to let Johnny take over your body and he goes on a bit of a rampage and he gets the tattoo, the person who gives him the tattoo is Dr. Cassius Ryder. He, even though he has this kind of back alley so ripper dock place, he is the franchise go. owner of those other ripper dogs. So he kind of just does his own thing and he makes bank from those other ripper dogs, I guess. Okay, another Witcher Easter egg. This is a smuggler's cache. Anyone that's very familiar with the Witcher games will remember the smuggler caches that are floating in water. Uh, they didn't often have anything particularly good in them from what I can remember. It's actually been a long time since I played through The Witcher 3. I really want to play again. Um, and uh, yeah, you can go and find them. This guy died trying to find them. Drowned Man, I think, is close to Drowner as well. All right, on to the next one. Okay, this is the Arasaka Memorial. A memorial to the destroyed Arasaka site. Uh, that happened in 2023 when Johnny Silverhand dropped the nuke down the lift shaft. And uh, there is a secret room. I say secret, it's not really massively secret. The only secret part about it really is that uh, you have to work out what the code is. And as a random guess, I put in the date and it was the date of 2023 when it happened. Uh, not very secure. Now there's a whole list of names in here. I haven't actually looked into who the names are, but I'm assuming they are people who worked on the game. They are developers, I would imagine. There's a lot of Polish names there. And uh, yeah, I, I would imagine that's the story here. It's a nice little room. Next up, we have another Breaking Bad Easter egg. This is kind of the proper one. You do get, there is a quest called the Heisenberg Principle, which is obviously a nod to Breaking Bad. But this one is a very physical, very real Easter egg. It is the camper van 
I think camper van's the right word, uh, where Jesse and Walter cook their meth out in the desert. Um, you've got a couple of things to confirm this. Uh, you've got the conversation between Jesse and Walter, or in this case, as they are known, James Reddington and Jin Arak. But one of the biggest clues is the fact that there's five bullet holes in the door of the caravan. I think there's something about a pizza being on top of the roof, but I couldn't find it. Um, I need to have a look into that more. But yeah, if you look here, this is where it's located. It's out in the desert in the Badlands, just here. And uh, yeah, when you turn up here, be prepared for a fight. Um, there are some automated defenses. If you check um, River's sister-in-law Joss's house and you look on top of it, there's a pizza on top. That's another Breaking Brad reference. That's the one that I thought should have been on the camper van, but I was reliably informed this is where it was. So there you go. That's a reference to the scene where Walter throws it up onto his house, but leaves it there. And that's what that's all about. So this next one is pretty cool. It's a multi-part reference. I would say it's a nod to two things all at once. So if you go to this area here, it's in amongst all the junk, just as you enter the Badlands. You look just here. That's a good place to go and uh, just pop into the trash and just have a look around. You will find a freezer or a fridge. It's one of those old style fridges. See, the first time it's actually a fridge and I call it a freezer. I'm always calling it freezers fridges, but this one actually is a fridge. And it's very important. It is a fridge. Um, and look, there's a big smoking hole in the floor. And you see something purple. We got a bit of purple loot here. So let's check it out. So we got a guy in a fridge. He's uh, not looking too hot. And look at that hat. Very familiar looking hat, don't you think? So what do we think here? Crystal Skull, perhaps? Um, there's a famous scene in Crystal Skull where basically Indy survives a blast from a nuclear explosion by going into one of those old style fridges. <laughs> I don't know, were they lead lined or something? Uh, something like that. But if you have a look here, we have, it's not Adam and Jamie, it's Stephen and Jim. And they're basically talking about an experiment uh, where they're testing the theory of whether or not you can survive a massive explosion from inside a refrigerator. So this is a dual reference to both Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull. And look, there's the Crystal Skull, quote unquote, and uh, Mythbusters, because it's Mythbusters where they test validity of movie tropes. And uh, yeah, so I thought that's pretty cool. And, and just like in Mythbusters, they would go out to the Mojave Desert and do their explosions and test them. Uh, yeah, so it's both a Mythbusters Easter egg and an Indiana Jones one. Pretty cool. It's a twofer. All right. Okay, next we have Angie's Key. I really don't know what to make of this one yet. It looks like it's possibly part of a bigger quest. After 1.5, it was added. Just this lady here. You can see you can find her around here. And she's crying on the docks. And if you uh, jump down into the water, you will see the key that was dropped. And you can give it back to her. I don't know if you should give it back to her or not. Um, I expect there'll be more on this to come. So yeah, apparently it is a actual reference to a quest in Beauclair's Garden in Blood and Wine. Thank you very much, Tomcat, for uh, putting me onto that. Okay, here's something you might not know. What happened to T-Bug? Well, if you go back into the Dew Drop Inn, not the hotel in Arroyo, but the shop in Kabuki Market up the top there, the one where you go first for, I think it's the uh, gift. When you talk to her, you can actually ask her what happened to T-Bug and she lets you know, it sucks, but it is what it is. Moving swiftly on. This is a really nice one. You can actually order Jackie Wells. Uh, so if you go down to the afterlife and you go to the purchase menu from Claire, you can actually order a Jackie Wells. So a shot of vodka, lime juice, ginger beer, and most importantly, a splash of love. So yeah, that's cool. Okay, the Akira bike. Um, there's a very famous anime, um, what, who am I telling? I guess you already know this, it's called Akira, and in it he has his bike. Now this is a much more angular version, but it still has the kind of lower at the front, higher at the back, red colour, very kind of anime, Japanese kind of style to it. And uh, yeah, it's actually probably one of my favourite looking bikes in the game, it just looks so good. Yeah, there you go, so there's that one. Okay, big in Japan. I've mentioned this one before in my katanas video. Basically, this is the one where you get the scalpel katana. Um, but this is actually a huge nod to the office. When you talk to the guy at the end of the quest, he actually quotes verbatim lines from the US office. His storyline is exactly the same and the sentences he uses are almost exactly the same. So uh, yeah, it's a, a massive nod to the office. That's such a huge Easter egg to actually have accurately quoted from a TV series. I think it was really interesting that they included it. Anyway, that was big in Japan. Uh, this one you might have missed. If you did the quest Woman of La Mancha and you didn't go back to the area where that quest happened, you will have not seen Bill Adams's body and the recorded conversation between him and Anna Hamill. Yeah, so she caught up to him and uh, exacted her revenge. Yeah, it's very easy to miss these things, but they do add these kind of uh, little bits of closure to missions, which is kind of cool. 
Okay, so this Easter egg is super awesome. Um, <laughs> but it is. Um, basically, it's Iron Man. So just in the Badlands, south of this fast travel point here, and just slightly south of the weapons dealer, there is a cave. I say cave, it's, so it's a small cave. So see her caravan there? She's just to the right. See that little cave? Okay, so in this, we have a few dead guys. And you've got what looks like a bunch of arms and things like that. And a couple of trucks, epic components, an engineering skill shard. That's not by chance. And journal from Thomas Starr, Militech engineer. And basically, I'm not going to spoil it for you if you haven't seen it. So you can quickly click off, but you can pause and read it if you want. But basically, it's the uh, first uh, Iron Man movie. Uh, exactly what happens there. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. I was really excited to find this one once I learned about it. So yeah, Iron Man. Awesome. Nice one. Good job. Still with me? Fair play. Well done. Let's get on with it. You can now walk by using the G key that was added in 1.5. Oh yeah, there's another thing that was added in 1.5, and I cover this in more detail in my Tips for New Players video, is the apartment buffs. So by drinking coffee, sharing, sleeping, all these different things actually give you buffs. But I go into more information on that if you want to check that out there. This isn't so much an Easter egg as um, something in the game that you might not notice straight away. We can see Johnny when he appears. He's a projection of our imagination. But this scene here, he actually moves or he changes our perception of something in the real world and it makes it look like he's interacting with it. He pulls out the stool and he sits down on it. But of course, he can't interact with objects in the real world. So he's manipulating what we can see. So that's very interesting. Makes you wonder what else is manipulated through the game. So when you're uh, doing the Nomad Life Path, you can actually get your starting car back. There's a quest called These Boots Are Made For Walking. Uh, when you're doing this quest, you meet another character whose name is Lana Prince. She's modeled after and voiced by an Australian video game writer and journalist. Her name is Alana Pierce, so the name is very similar. So yeah, that's, again, it's kind of cool. It's nice to see these little cameos. You might have missed Heroes. My very first playthrough, I missed Heroes because I sent Jackie's body back to Vix um, and, and I got Jackie's tuned arch keys delivered to me by Mama Wells. Um, so I didn't even know there was an Ofrenda. Um, but yeah, you, you these things are, are, are great to discover in the game as well, but you might have missed it and you might still not be aware. There's a whole quest where you basically give Jackie a send off and you get to have a rummage through his stuff in his garage with Misty. It's pretty cool and definitely worth checking out. Easter egg is pretty cool. Um, are you familiar with a movie called Old Boy? Uh, they remade it recently. I can't remember who was in it. Was it Thomas Jane or someone? I can't actually remember who it was because I didn't actually watch the remake. I, I watched the original one just because I watched it before they made the remake, not because I was being, um, you know, cool or anything. Um, but basically, there's a scene in it, a very famous hallway scene. Now, this isn't in a hallway, but that doesn't really matter. But still, the moment you go around and you see a lot of dead people with knives and tools, you realize it's this scene. And um, yeah, I'm not going to spoil Old Boy in any way for you. If you haven't watched it, don't look into spoilers or anything. Just watch the movie and just see it through to the end. I'm not going to say anything. Um, but yeah, this references it. This talks about what happens in the movie with kind of, it's almost spoilers, but not really. It doesn't really, it just, it gives you the premise of the movie, but that's it. But yeah, there's a famous fight scene in it. I'd imagine even if you haven't seen Old Boy, you've seen this fight scene where he takes on a whole corridor full of gangsters and he actually gets a knife in the back at one point and he keeps on fighting while he's got this knife in his back. And look, the knife is in the back there. And his main weapon when he's fighting them is a hammer and he's got a hammer on him and uh, the note on him confirms everything. All right. That's pretty cool. You're probably familiar with the blue eyed man at this point. In one of the endings, you'll actually meet him face to face, but you actually see him for the first time during the dream on job. And if you look over there, that's where he's standing. He stands there for the whole time. And then if you watch for a while, he will eventually just disappear. I don't know if that's a programmatical thing or whether it's meant to be like a teleportation. I don't know. But if you can see he's watching the whole time, there's a lot of theories around him, but also it's worth noting. He's very, very similar looking to the elusive man. So I think this is a big nod to the elusive man as well. He's definitely the same kind of figure, uh, but there's, there's a lot of things about him that are very interesting. I just want to thank Evan Hawkins for the next one. Uh, he told me about an additional Easter egg relating to Pulp Fiction. Um, so if you remember, I mentioned uh, the one in the gig Bloodsport where they reference Coolidge, who's Bruce Willis's character in the movie. Well, if you go to this area here, uh, you can actually find him. So there he is. And if you can remember, as with a lot of Tarantino movies, Katana's played a part. Um, so there we have Katana's chef's knife as well.
So, you know, that's definitely him. Look at the hand wraps. So that's pretty cool. And that is it's either Marcellus Wallace. It kind of looks like it's supposed to be Marcellus Wallace, but it could also be Vince Vega. Um, and if we look at it, we've got Vincent Vac, which is Vince Vega, and Marcellus Wayans, who's Marcellus Wallace. So I'm not sure if that's supposed to be Marcellus or Vincent Vega there. But yeah, that's pretty cool. So basically, there, there they are. That's what happened to Butch. They eventually tracked him down, I guess. It's a different outcome to the movie, but the point is not to recreate the movie. So uh, yeah. So there you go. I would imagine it's probably Vince. The hair looks a lot more like Vince than it does Marcellus. Marcellus was bald in it. So uh, yeah, anyway, moving on. Now, this was a nice one. I only noticed this after 1.5. Um, perhaps it was always in there and I just never noticed it before. It's in a couple of places. One most notably because it has at least four of these terminals is the chapel in Pacifica that you go to for a couple of quests, including transmission. It's basically a digital confession booth but you literally pay for your sins. <laughs> it's kind of a little irreverent probably for some people, but uh, yeah, I thought it was kind of cool. It's just a nice touch, I think. Uh, this is a really nice little additional Half-Life Easter egg. If you get a crowbar, just take a look at it. Look at what it says. The favorite tool of burglars and theoretical physicists from MIT. I think we know who that's referring to. I don't need to talk more on that. Let's move on. Okay, very tiny one. In the ending, where is my mind? There's a box on the shelf. And if you scan it, the model is Cyber Cerberus. Now, I should probably have a look through the rest of the game, see if there's anything else that has the same model. But I'm just kind of thinking, you're in a space station, you're being repaired. I wonder, is that a nod to Cerberus in Mass Effect 2 when you're on a space station being put back together? After thinking about it, Cerberus is the two-headed dog that guards the entrance to hell to stop people from escaping, basically. So it's very interesting that that box, which if you scan it initially, it's not Cerberus. It says like a medical kit or something. And then you scan it again later, it comes up as Cyber Cerberus or something. I thought that was very interesting. It's like the hell ending. And when you're doing the cube in that ending, it's the devil you see. So the whole thing kind of fits. Okay, there's an NCPD hustle in the Watson area uh, where all you have to do is eliminate the enemies and search for the evidence to complete it. Um, but if you're not listening or if you don't read the shards, you won't actually notice what's going on here. This is tied in with Jotaro. Um, he seems to be quite prevalent in the bad doings of Watson. Um, you take him out in one gig. But if you read, you'll see that there's human trafficking going on. Basically, these people are being delivered to him and they're in a container. And if you listen carefully, you can actually hear them banging on the container. Now you can not notice this and walk away. Um, probably if you come back later, I'm not sure whether they'll still be alive or not, but uh, I should probably test that but you don't have to let them out for the mcpd hustle you don't even get a quest update but you know who would leave them in there they're hammering away so yeah that's easily missable so do watch out for that and if you did miss it and you want to go back and check it out let me know if they did suffocate because that's kind of horrendous but uh, yeah anyway let's go okay most people will have missed this one i, I did my first two playthroughs um it was only after looking into um ff06 b5 that i came across somebody who discovered this and yeah it's actually really easy to get to them so on the quest Dream On, uh, when you're chasing the van down, if you get out straight away and you look to the back of the compound, you'll see two figures trying to flee. If you watch them, they'll actually get up to a cloaked AV and fly away. But you can, if you're quick enough, jump up and get to them and take them down before they leave. One of them has an interesting shard. I won't go into it now because that's for another video. And uh, yeah, they're very easy to miss. And um, you can't actually fly off on AVs anymore. They have a wall that the AV flies through that knocks you off, which is a pain because that used to be kind of fun. Now, this one, I'm not 100% sure if my interpretation is correct, but I believe this is a Mario reference. Now, there is a bunker in the middle of the Badlands and in it there is a note. And there's a nice quick hacking shard for you as well. But if you read the note, it's from a person called Bad and it's basically saying that the princess is in another castle. So, you know, perhaps this bunker is meant to be one of the one of I, I don't know. It's tenuous. I think it's perhaps a Mario reference, but maybe it's something else. Um, discuss this one in the comments below. Let me know what you think. There's a gig That's you can easily miss called one. I'll Fly Away and you get it just before you get Queen of the Highway. Just after the gig, little help from my friends, you'll get an additional mission which you won't get notified of. You won't get a text message or at least I never have. I think some people might have, but I think it might be buggy on that front. But basically, you've got to go to the Nomad Camp before they move and before you start Queen of the Highway. So I would go there straight after that quest. Otherwise, you'll miss it. I actually missed it in my most recent playthrough because I just wasn't paying attention. In it, you help no, Mitch give Scorpion idea. a proper send-off, or at least proper send-off Aldo Caldo style or 
to Scorpion's wishes. In that mission, you get handed a statue of Scorpion from Mortal Kombat. You also get a nice, unique knife called Stinger. Again, playing with a Scorpion theme. Um, yeah, and you can then put that figurine in your apartment. And nobody in the game, of course, knows what it is. We don't know what it is, but uh, I thought that was kind of cute. But uh, yeah, so there's that one. Okay, I've mentioned Judy's tattoos before, specifically the one with the shark with the laser beam, because honestly, that's my favorite. Uh, but she has some other ones. I'm going to kind of bundle them into one. Basically, she's got a couple of musical lyrics. One is from Red Hot Chili Peppers' Parallel Universe. Um, if you listen to the lyrics, it fits really well. There's another one which is actually a lyric from a Radiohead song called Pyramid Song. Now, the cool thing about that is that she actually has a mission based on this as well. And the video of Pyramid Song has somebody scuba diving around a sunken city. So it's all very much tied in. So I think that's kind of cool. Um, one of my favorite ones is her ghost in the shell tattoo. This is also the icon in the top left hand corner when she calls you. It looks like uh, King Boo perhaps from Mario. I'm not sure. Again, can't say that really one way or another. Coming out of what looks like a scallop shell. A literal ghost in the shell, but a nod to the very popular popular anime. Okay, in Watson in Kabuki, uh, not too far from where the dancing robot is, you can also find a car submerged underwater and a guy who's basically a gambler who thought all his problems were solved when he won a cat. The cat is fine, the cat is on the box just above the water, and uh, yeah, as we know from talking to Takamura, um, cats are often seen as potentially spirits, especially now that they're so rare, spirits which are portents of doom and the bringer of bad fortune. And look what happened to this guy. So uh, yeah, and there's the little kitty cat. I don't know if it's the same kitty cat we have in our apartment or if there's just lots of these around but you do see this one quite a few times i have a feeling like the unicorn in blade runner this cat is a symbol that's supposed to be seen at key times you see it in johnny's past you see it while you're uh doing i think it's down on the street with takamura it's in your apartment you see it here you see it in other places so i'm just wondering is it intentionally a motif like the unicorns in blade runner yeah, there's an extra joy toy there's actually five joy toys and she's notable because johnny has commentary to say on her not particularly kind but uh, yeah you can find her in and around jig jig street so yeah okay this is a kind of real multi-part thing there is um now this was missable before i believe but he has a quest icon now so you should be able to find it when it spawns but there's a weapon you can get an iconic weapon called skippy i'm sure you know about him but you might not know everything about him. Firstly, he hums Disturbia. Dum, dum, dee, dum, 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 da, dum, dum. He has lots of little lines he says to you, uh, little quips. Uh, you know, did you know that you, according to Christian doctrine, you're going to hell? All these kind of funny things. And, you know, about decapitation. Very unpleasant stuff. But there's so much more about him, okay? Firstly, you can select if you want to have him in pacifist mode or uh, headshot mode, basically. If you have him in the mode where he goes for headshots, after 50 kills, he will switch to the kneecapping mode. If you have him in the kneecapping mode, which is probably actually a nod to Arnie in T2, um, because, again, they have the same interaction with him. He's an AI, and you ask him not to kill, so he just shoots people in the legs. But if you select that puppy-loving mode, uh, he will then switch to the killing mode after 50 kills. Now, here's another thing you might not know about him. After 1.5, if you have Skippy on you equipped and you go into a Delamain cab or whatever cab you have after the Delamain quest, you will see an interaction, um, a conversation between the two of them. It's very short, but it's cool. It's quite a complimentary interaction they have. And finally, the quest isn't finished when you get Skippy. You might have noticed or you might not have noticed how there's a quest icon on Skippy and you can't actually put him in your stash. That's because he has a quest. Basically, once you've gotten those 50 kills, keep him on you, walk around for a while, and you'll get the final quest for him, at which point you can decide to return him to his owner or not. Um, yeah, and that's it. If you choose not to, you can keep him in your stash, but it doesn't close the quest. And he has a couple of glitches, like sometimes when you right click to zoom, he will fire. So there's so much about that one little weapon. It's awesome. Um, yeah. Ah, oh, check out the pets. Once in a while, when you go into the uh, apartment, you're going to see the two of them snuggling up on the beanbag together. And, uh, V notices it too. This is another Pulp Fiction reference. Kinda cool. There's a clothing brand you can get. Specifically, there's a hybrid weave t-shirt and it's Dead Z. And obviously, we've seen a couple of other Pulp Fiction references in there. This is referencing uh, Zed's dead baby, Zed's dead, which is a famous line. If you get a chance, I'm not going to go through them all. But whenever you have uh, junk items and vendor fodder, take a look at it. They put some really interesting and really fun descriptions on them. Definitely worth checking it out. 
Now, rather than doing a post on each car, I'd imagine they all have references, but it's definitely worth checking them out. I mean, you've got um, you've got the Chevillon Emperor, which is the Dominator. So there's the Dominator in Storm Chasers, which is a very beefy vehicle. And then one of the archers is called the Bandit, or it's just called Bandit. So smoking the Bandit. Uh, you've got the archer course Barghest, which is, uh, well, a Barghest is a mythical creature, kind of a big black dog type of thing and you, you see them in the witcher and everything else i think in the witcher they're not just dogs they're the kind of like um ghost dogs as opposed to dogs i can't remember exactly but yeah they're uh, not pleasant but they're kind of dog-like things you've got an apollo called gremlin and you've got wendigo which is another mythical creature you've got cthulhu reaver these are all great names gecko ghoul the rat revenant they've got great names warhorse beast vato yeah so they got really cool names Okay, this is uh, another Matrix Easter egg, and I think this is probably the best. You know, there's lots of other little references and little mentions and little kind of nods and winks, but for me, this is by far the best Easter egg of the lot for the Matrix. So you go to Haywood and you head around to this area here, and you see that red light, it kind of draws you up there. It caught my eye, so I wanted to get up there. And lo and behold, we have a dead body up there. Let's check it out. Yeah, even Johnny says, fuck, Keanu. So if we have a look here, we have a skill shard, which are blades. Pretty cool, because I'm a blades user. And a conversation between John Anderson and Orpheus. And basically, it's the conversation that Neo has at the start of the very first Matrix movie. Uh, this one doesn't go quite as well for uh, this version of him. But there you go, I thought that was pretty damn cool. I thought this was nifty, but uh, you can see crowds of people doing actual Tai Chi and they are following the form properly. They've actually properly mo-capped the Tai Chi. The moves are excellent. Very good form, I have to say. Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, so uh, Rogue's weapons. She has two. She has a, an assault rifle and she has a pistol. These are in the endgame. The one you take with Rogue. The two weapons you get from her are Pride and Prejudice. That's a Jane Austen. Is it Jane Austen? I think it's Jane Austen. I'm not sure. Uh, that's a period drama that um, I believe. <laughs> This is one of my favorites. It's another Blade Runner reference. This is the Void Kampf machine. Now they don't call it the Void Kampf machine in this, but it measures pupillary responses, just like the one in Blade Runner. You come across this in the Where Is My Mind ending. Oh, I hate that ending. It's like hell. Good morning. Now I've got some good news for you. You're in a cornfield. Tall, green plants, as far as the eye can see. Let me tell you about my mother. Okay, so this is interesting. I actually missed this one and it was pointed out to me, as you can see here, so this is pretty cool. But the uh, caretaker spade, and I actually thought this must be from something, but I didn't bother looking into it. Boltez. Yeah, it's from the Hearts of Stone expansion of The Witcher. There's a boss you fight called the caretaker and he happens to drop this exact spade. And you can see it here. I don't actually remember the fight, even though I did do Hearts of Stone. So that's really good because when I go back to The Witcher 3, when they release the update later this year, there's going to be so much in it that I've forgotten. It's going to be like a whole fresh experience for me. I'm really excited. Anyway, moving on. The Rayfield Callenburn has a brother car or sister car, uh, another car in the family, and it's the Rayfield Erendite. Again, now this is a sword from The Witcher. This is another Witcher Easter egg. Behold, your Erendite. We've met before. Certainly. So that's pretty cool as well. It's also a car that's confused a lot with the caliber. It's two different cars. Now this is a whole cluster of Easter eggs in one. If you check out all the poses in photo mode, you'll see that there's lots and lots of like referential Easter eggs to things in pop culture. And there's loads of stuff in there. Go and have a route through and see if there's any that you recognize. Okay, where are we at? We've hit 150, that's amazing. Okay, let's keep going. This was a nice little one. I have no idea if it's referencing anything in particular, but it's a nice one to find anyway. You'll notice out in the desert, there is a big crashed ship. And again, like so many times, there is a reporter or a media as they're called here, who's gone out to investigate it. And um, yeah, has come to a sticky end, shall we say. So I don't know if this is reference to anything, but it does seem again, like media don't survive too well in Night City. And uh, yeah, I don't know what this is. I mean, to be honest with you, this ship reminds me of the Sulaco, like just the look of it, but I don't really know if that's what it's supposed to be. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's an awesome looking ship. It's just some cargo ship that crashed. But anyway, yeah, check it out. 
I was pretty amazed to find out that there was actually a Harry Potter reference in this. Yeah, there's a platform 69 and three quarters. Now the six is uh, blacked out. So at first glance, you'll only see nine and three quarters. And it has two hands pointing to an area with hit here. And it's got grim blood splats where people have been trying to actually get through the wall. <laughs> oh man, that's actually really good. And if you want to find that, it's in Wellsprings. When you're questing with Rogue and you're in her car, take a look at the number plate. It says Rogue One. Now, obviously, her name is Rogue, and a lot of times people will do their name and the one after it for their personalized number plate. But in this case, it's probably coincidental. But, you know, Rogue One is a Star Wars movie. Perhaps there's just a little nut there, but I don't know. And here's Maximum Mike. This is Mike Pondsmith. Here's just a little clip of him on the radio. Okay, people, listen up. This one comes to me from a listener who raises a great question, and he suggests an answer. How does the Arasaka family live so long? This isn't a big thing, it's just a little bit of cash if you want it, and a golden flamingo, I think. Um, but if you take a look in the front of Kerry Uridine's residence, there's a metal detector for some reason in the sand. Um, must have been looking for treasure, but if you dive into the little kind of... He has actually a swimble kind of... I wouldn't call it a pool, but it's a kind of a, a natural looking pond. But at the bottom of it, you can see there, you can get some money from the little box. Here's another little Syria one. Pretty hard to see, but it's actually a bit of graffiti with Cirilla rules on it. Pretty cool. Much later in the game, after you've done Sinner Man, the pretty horrible quest line. But yeah, see this poster you see here? Uh, that is a digital poster anyway. Uh, is for the BD that is created with or without your help. So I've often lamented the lack of a shooting range. But um, I only noticed this recently, and David Anderson, you also noticed it too, um, that the shooting range in Kabuki Market is usable. I don't actually know. And here you go. This is how easy it is to miss things. I don't know if it was always this or whether they quietly enabled it in a recent patch. So yeah, there is a shooting range you can actually use, and you'll actually know it's there because you'll hear people shooting. Um, I don't remember that before, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. I'm sure you'll let me know if it was there from the start or not. Okay, back, I think it might have been after 1.3, but either way, it was early this year. Uh, they added three new adverts. Basically, they added, forgive me on these names, but they added um, Otogia, Anidia, and Otsuchi. Basically, they're three streamers, and they've been featured in the uh, Fiyotsuki Electronics ads. There's three different ones, and they've all kind of got uh, ghetto blasters on their shoulders. Uh, these three are uh, basically very influential streamers in, I think it might be Japan. I should probably research my videos more or <laughs> just trying to rely on my memory. But yeah, I think they're Japanese streamers. Yeah, so kind of cool. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Okay, this is a ghost in the shell Easter egg. So Lieutenant Mower, uh, the very first, you typically she'd be one of the first cyber psychos you're going to come across because she's in Watson and she's the first one I came across. Um, so it's a reference to Major Motoko Kusanagi from Ghost in the Shell. Uh, she mower even looks like her and i believe uh, when translated kusanagi's name is something along the lines of grass cutter so that's where the reference goes she even looks like her with the visor so uh, yeah another pretty cool ghost in the show reference ah excalibur so wait no that's <laughs> <I've> had... <laughs> that's definitely not excalibur but if we just go down here uh, yet yeah, you'll find that, uh, we <laughs> sorry about that. I have no idea why they have that stuck on there, but they do. Uh, there's a sword in the stone. It's a sword embedded in the concrete that you can pull out very easily. It's nothing particularly special, but you know, sword in the stone, Excalibur, you know, it's gotta be right. Or, you know, randomly, otherwise for some reason, somebody managed to stick a, a samurai sword or a katana in, in some solid concrete. Since 1.5, they did a weather update and uh, the weather is more kind of intense or whatever and uh, they have better weather. But also, um, when it rains, people bring out umbrellas. It's really cool. So they didn't have umbrellas before 1.5, but they do now. It's iconic having loads of people walk around with umbrellas. It's one of the very first things you see in Blade Runner after the initial intro. Um, so it's quite iconic and it's great to see people walk around with umbrellas in this. Sensible. Oh, there's another little uh, nice area for some extra goodies just here. If you sneak onto this yacht in this marina here, uh, you'll find a few goodies on it. So definitely worth getting. Whoa, this is a long one. I did warn you. Okay, let's keep pressing on. Yeah, during the quest last login, 
If you don't read what's actually on the computer down below, you won't actually know. But if you do and you read it, you'll see that Bucky, the Ripper Doc upstairs, who is critical to that money making method that we love so much, is actually involved in the goings on down there. His hands are not clean. And if you go up the back door into his office, you can actually question him. If you don't read that computer, you won't have known that he was involved and you would have continued to use him as a Ripper Doc uh, completely obliviously. But you can go up and you can confront him about it. So little things like that, you know, they're it's not so much an easter egg but you might have missed it and you might not have known that he was a dirty ripper duck greetings from des moines now this appears in your apartment um basically you find this at one point in v's apartment and it says jump in the urinal and stand on your head i'm the one that's alive you're all dead now this is a quote from philip k dick's ubik which is a 1969 novel now i've not read ubik and because of this i'm gonna read it i've read uh, do androids dream of electric sheep but not this how and why it appears in V's apartment, no idea. It just does. Okay, this is tenuous, but um, I'm going to run with it. It's a real quick one. Uh, you'll see this skull graffiti all over the place, in quite a few places anyway. Um, I reckon this is a little subtle nod to the Punisher. I mean, that is definitely like, okay, a skull motif isn't uniquely the Punisher, but the way the bottom half of the skull is drawn out is definitely very Punisher-esque. And a lot of the ways as a merc, I kind of feel like you're almost like the Punisher. Um, so yeah, anyway, moving on. Here's a really clever little thing that you might not have noticed or you might have twigged on one or two of them, but it's actually, I'm 90% sure it's all of them. So I'm going to say it's all of them, but it's very possibly there's a couple that aren't, but at the very least, the vast majority of missions in this game, so jobs and stuff, are named after song titles. War Pigs, Space Oddity, you name it. A lot of stuff happens in the Heist Quest. When you're doing the heist quest and you are walking the flathead through the different rooms, one of the rooms you come across actually has Holt and Ryan okay, discussing a situation you. with a bunch of Arasaka suits or agents. The They're playing for time. Arasaka will cover the cost of any and all penalties assessed. This isn't about the money. It's election season. How do you think this will make period of time after that meeting, it just so happens that his implant fails. Coincidence? I think I'm probably from. not. A week. That's all we can promise you. We will try. Oh man, we're getting through this. You may have missed this. Um, I've included this in my 37 tips video, but I think it's worth mentioning here for people who haven't watched that. You can actually use the holograms as flashbangs and basically if you destroy them by either shooting the hologram projector at the bottom or hacking it to make it overload it makes a very bright flash it's kind of cool um when you're coming up to the final quest and you're sitting up on the balcony with misty when she leaves she tells you to take your time and if you do take your time and you have got the friendship levels with johnny up high enough taking your time is actually the last step in unlocking the don't fear the reaper ending the secret ending you might have missed it you might not have gotten it and it's one of these things that takes a lot of work or at least luck to get it or you have to go and read the guides on how to do it there are plenty of guides ign have a very very good guide on that one for example uh, loads of people do um basically the secret ending is don't fear the reaper and uh, yeah you basically single-handedly get to take on arasaka and it gives you the same post game ending as path of glory it's just obviously ever so slightly different and you nobody is sacrificed or you there's an airport where you do a quest and I think there's an MCP, the hustle there as well. After you've done the quest there, if you go up to it, you'll find there's a reporter who's been investigating stuff again. And um, he's at the very top of this, I guess it's a radar tower and he's come to a grisly end, I suppose. Um, but he has some loot there and some notes about what he was looking into. Did you notice how V faints during the storyline quests for the four romance options? When you're in the club that's been ransacked by the animals, if you try on the BD wreath, you pass out. You're brought to with River looking at you. V. You okay? My. V. Come on. You hear me? Breathe. When you're with Kerry, you get woozy and pass out. You wake up with him looking at you. Johnny, you okay? Same with Pan Am. I... V, relax. Everything is okay. How do you feel? And the same with Judy. Uh, v, everything okay? 
V, you don't look so. <sighs> okay. So there's there's four separate occasions. You have this moment where you're like a damsel in distress, where you pass out. You you come to with your friend or romance interest uh, looking at you. So. This really is a relationship building device that gives you a moment of weakness and shows how much the other person cares for you. So it kind of grows that bond. Right, we're nearly there. This one is, uh, uh, um, there was a movie, it starred uh, John Goodman and uh, he, basically a movie about some guy trapping a girl in the bunker with him to quote unquote save her. Uh, you know, and, and basically the scene that you have here is, spoiler alert, pretty much uh, what happens in the movie so uh, yeah it's unmistakably Cloverfield line. I just want to say thanks to Randy Mark Lee for putting me onto this one. It's actually an interesting list of Netwatch agents you can find no in the subway agent, tunnels during much. transmission. Um, it's just at the back here. It's quite notable because it seems like the handles of Netwatch agents are very, as everything is in this game, very referential. I would imagine they all mean different things to different people. A couple that stand out for me. Specifically, we have Lord of Rivia. We have Pinocchio. It's probably Pinocchio. Lord Nyrus rings a bell. We've got Mr. Neo, spelled N-I-O. We have Seventh Padawan. Spineless Wonder rings a bell. Brooks says, which is like uh, Brooks say. Stormcaller. If I remember rightly, Stormcaller is something. I think that was a weapon in World of Warcraft. I have memory serves. Paramedic Jack, Samurai Jack, Handsome Jack, Something Jack is very common. And the reason I was put onto this one was the one that Randy mentioned was 10538, seemingly innocuous. That is actually a name of one of ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra's songs. Thank you very much for that one. And there we go. That's 175. Oh my God. This guy here selling you BDs, his name is Lenny Nero. Now, um, I think he's referenced in one of the other quests as well, uh, if I remember rightly. But he's based on a character played by Ralph Fiennes in the film Strange Days, which was a 1995 cyberpunk uh, movie. And his character in that movie was a seller of things called Squid Recordings, and the same kind of deal as Brain Dances. Check out the design on this car. Uh, this one is made to look very much like Eleanor. It's, oh, it's a very classic, the silver with the two black stripes on it. But yeah, it's made, made to look very much like Eleanor from Gone in 60 Seconds. Um, if you head out into the Badlands, just this area here, uh, you will find two guys. They are named very similarly to the main characters from Brokeback Mountain. And uh, there's a cowboy hat and the conversation between them. A neat little one that um, Empty Wallet Syndrome pointed out to me. If you don't ride with Tack to see Wakako, um, when you meet him there, the dialogue is pretty funny. I hadn't actually seen it until he pointed out, so I'm going to just share it with you there. The man, the legend, in the flesh. Oh, you're just in time. Do you know who this is? Hideshi Hino, the late night comedy host. He was brilliant before he fell off the wagon. Can you still do your famous better bugger up? No. Come on, you don't forget a thing like that. Just once, please. V, we should go in now. Hideshi, don't leave this poor guy hanging. This is not the best time, truly. Oh, come on. I haven't heard it in years. Oh. Bitter Bakurap! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Inosan, what happened to you? I do not know. I do not recognize Oh, that's brilliant. Myself. And yeah, now the uh, don't go happy? handing out autographs comment go. makes a lot more sense. It's so easy to miss things like that. Fine, let's go. Hideshi Hino, to have fallen so far. Such a shame. So just near the pumping station, there is this guy here. You just go down onto the beach. Um, and there's basically, it's a veteran who, yeah, does nasty things. You can read the shard yourself. Um, but he's kind of having a bit of, a, I guess, a psychotic break and believes he's on secret operations in South America in the jungles. Um, that's actually a story adapted from Ghost in the Shell, Stand Alone Complex. Okay, just a few things that are kind of inspirations that are from other things, which are interesting. Um, the mega buildings fired by, I would say anyway, Judge Dredd's mega buildings, like peach trees, things like that. 
I think it's funny that the acronym for Bart Moss's demons is rabbits, um, giving that the only thing I can think of every time I hear it is raving rabbits. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's probably coincidence. Oh, and I thought this was kind of cute. The movie list here, that was uh, that's clearly uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. I thought that was kind of funny. You get to a point when you wonder if everything in this game just a reference to something. There was a cyberpunk movie called Johnny Mnemonic back in the day and um, well, about 20 years ago I saw something like that. It stars Keanu Reeves. I'm not going to spoil the movie in case you haven't seen it but it's definitely worth a watch. And along with Neuromancer it's a very heavy influence on this game. Okay, there's a sign um, in uh, Kabuki, near enough the troublesome neighbor gig that you get for Regina Jones. And there's a neon sign there and it's got Motel Hello. But the O on the Hello is gone. And that's based on a horror movie. And you can see here the exact same thing in the horror movie called Motel Hell. So there you go. Now, Children of Men. It's a movie starring Clive Owen. It's also a book. And this Easter egg is referring to that. Basically, it's a dystopian future where the human race has become infertile but one woman does manage to miraculously get pregnant. If I remember rightly it's quite a good movie actually, I must watch that again. Uh, Theo Farron is Clive Owen's character in the movie and he's trying to help this one lady to escape. Uh, yeah. You might not have been aware that your vehicle has a stash in it, even the motorbikes. If you go to the back of them, you get direct access to the stash. It's the same stash in your apartment. So basically, uh, it's like a, an all-in-one inventory that you don't have to go to your apartments to visit. I was checking out the North Oaks sign as a Hollywood reference, but I, th I think that's one of the most obvious things. But when I was doing that, I found something way more interesting. There's actually a drone that was being made carry too much and it crashed into the North. You can see the smoke coming up from the O of Oak. And yeah, he has a little skill shard and um, his flight path and what went wrong. You can find a shard um, titled Chemicals, the Invisible Killer. This is actually another office reference. As somebody working in CD Projekt Red was a huge office fan. Um, and basically it has, uh, the illness is actually one from the show. It's a fictional one that they created that makes your teeth liquefy and <laughs> drip down your throat. Um, spontaneous dental hydroplosion. So yet another office reference. I mentioned Johnny Mnemonic briefly, but there's actually a very specific Johnny Mnemonic reference. Basically, he is a courier that can store information in his head. Your storage capacity? I can carry nearly 80 gigs of data in my head. Input. These posters I noticed here, and they just instantly made me think of the T-1000 from Terminator 2, but probably more specifically actually the TX, the female Terminator, who's kind of a combination of both uh, the T-800 and the T-1000. Um, yeah, and I know Lizzy Wizzy is completely chromed out as well, but seeing this poster of uh, a metal person sitting in a flaming car just screams Terminator, so yeah. Now there's a movie starring Jude Law and Forrest Whitaker called Repo Men. It's pretty good. Um, at least I think so. And basically it's a, a future where people spend fortunes on replacement organs like livers and things like that, and uh, if they fail to keep up payments, a repo men come to collect the organ. Now, this isn't specifically referring to that movie. You know, uh, in this case, it's an Arasaka employee who's had their cyberware turned off, but it just made me think instantly of that, how corporations can be so cruel and put money out of human life. So pretty dark stuff. But uh, yeah, maybe Arasaka repo is going to turn up to collect the cyberware off this poor guy soon enough. There's another Sherlock Holmes reference. Now, this one is definitely a Sherlock Holmes reference. Um, if you just jump over the wall here, you'll see the names here are obviously pointing to Baker Street and Arthur Conan Doyle. And if you look at this quote here, it is a famous quote from Sherlock Holmes. So this is definitely that. My reputation, such as it is, will suffer shipwreck if I'm so candid. Omne ignotum pro magnifico. Everything becomes commonplace by explanation. Watson, that is a very loose translation. Okay, I'm sure you've all seen the Milfgaard posters. I think this is the most uh, safe for work one of the lot. <laughs> um, and clearly this is a Witcher reference to Nilfgaard. But uh, yeah, th there you go. Okay, did you know that you could get back into clouds after the quest Automatic Love? Well, you can. Uh, I'll just show you, just go around here. around this ledge and this isn't actually opened until after the mission.
So it's like a back door in case you forgot to get the cocktail stick and you want to go back in. But yeah, there you go. If you want to have a nosy around, you've got the place to yourself. I like how they've included the wick flick. It's not necessarily an easter egg, but it is something really popularized and made famous by John Wick. And uh, yeah, they've included it in this weapons reload animation. It's pretty cool. Okay, I missed this on my first go. Absolutely. Uh, you can ride the roller coaster with Johnny Silverhand. The reason you might have missed it is because the mission becomes unavailable after you do double life. And you could do double life quite early depending on how you follow the quest and you might not have been anywhere near Pacifica, especially since you're not pointed to Pacifica until double life. So it's kind of silly that it becomes unavailable at that point. But either way, if you go there afterwards, you can still ride the roller coaster by going down and fixing the fuse box, but you don't have the whole conversation and the quest around it, which is worthwhile doing. So it's worth checking that out. I've got a whole video walkthrough for this job. It's one of the ones that's still truly hidden because it has no quest icon. Um, but this is a hidden job called The Highwayman. And yeah, it's it's totally worthwhile doing, actually. You find it just here. That's all you need to know. Just go here and get stuck in. Oh yeah, there's also a really cool bike at the end of it, but you have to work out where to find it. I'm not going to tell you anything because the fun is in the doing, so go for it. Um, if you didn't register with GOG or you didn't buy the GOG version, good old games, uh, that's CD Projekt Red's version of Steam essentially, DRM free kind of thing. Pretty cool. Um, if you register with it or you bought it from there, you will have gotten a few extra Witcher goodies. For example, the Black Unicorn Sword, which I feature in quite a lot of my videos. You would have gotten the Wolf School Jacket and uh, a couple of other bits and pieces. But yeah, so uh, they're in your apartment. You get them automatically anyway, once you register that. The Beast of Beauclair is played by many of the guitar playing individuals and denizens of uh, Night City and even in the Aldecados camp. It's the song that plays during the battle in Witcher 3 uh, where you fight Detlaf when he is in vampire form. I'm not going to talk through this one, but in case you haven't found them all, these are the locations for Johnny Silverhand's clothes if you want to get the full outfit. And there you go. Go cosplay Johnny Silverhand as V. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much for watching. If you found this useful, don't forget to like and subscribe. And don't forget we've got a Discord if you want to come and say hi and have a chat. If not, leave your comments below and your timestamps if you're referring to something specific so I can jump to it nice and easily and see what you're talking about. And I just want to let you know if you've been here to the end or you've been hanging out and you've enjoyed it, I'm going to be streaming a lot more regularly now. I'll be streaming between YouTube and Twitch, so you'll see notifications for YouTube here. And for Twitch, you just have to go and follow me there. The link is in the description. Um, it'll be mainly evening times, GMT onwards, weekdays is typically when I'll be streaming. And it will be really cool to hang out with you and catch up there. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for hanging out. I'll see you in my next one. Take care. Bye. Meow.